Welcome, everybody. I'm here with, with the youth minister of the Bamel Church of Christ in Houston and a couple of, of young men that I think have, have been or are still in his youth group. And we're going to talk about what I think is a really interesting situation that occurred. And I guess we'll just start. Sean, Sean would you like to maybe introduce yourself and, and tell people a little bit about you? Yeah, you know, Sean Richardson, um, youth minister uh, at Bamel Church of Christ here in Houston, um, Texas. Um, I've been at Bamel for about five years now. Um, I grew up in New Orleans, Louisiana, so huge Saints fan, huge LSU fan. Um, and I moved to Houston um, after Hurricane Katrina. Um, and shortly afterwards, just decided to um, stay here in Houston. Um, I met my wife here in Houston, and we have two beautiful kids. Um, Isabel, who's 12, and Christian, who is eight. Um, so we've been at Bamble five years now. And I've been a youth minister here um, just about the whole time. Started off as just being a volunteer um, where I met Trevor, um, who was an eighth grader when I met him. Um, but I've been knowing AJ since he was in sixth grade because we uh, worship at Garden Oaks Church of Christ, um, a little south of uh, Bamble in Houston. Um, so it's been a good ride, and uh, I'm honored to walk alongside these young men and their families. Oh, that's great. I'm an Oklahoma Sooners fan, so we may have to end this interview right now <laughs> after what LSU did to us last year or earlier this good year. Good program, OU. Good program. Uh, but did you flee? Did you fled Hurricane Katrina, and that's how you ended up in Houston? Yeah, I, we were staying with some family during the time of the hurricane. We left New Orleans the day before. We were in Orange, Texas. Um, and then we decided to come to Houston, Texas. I was with my, my parents um, and my, my sister, my brother-in-law at the time. And uh, all my family eventually moved back to New Orleans. Um, and I stayed here um, in Houston. Um, I was working as, at Best Buy, uh, working in retail management. Um, and then I left Best Buy and I started being, um, I started working for a company called Mark, Market Source that represents um, Hewitt Packard. And there I served as a national program uh, manager and a regional sales executive um, and then just got the calling to have an opportunity to be a uh, full-time youth minister at BAML and just decided to make the sacrifice and give up comfort for calling and uh, it's been one of the best decisions that I've made. Well were you a Christian when you when you came to Houston or did or did you no. find Christ once you came to Houston? I did you know it was almost like a parting of the Red Sea for me the the water pushed me to Houston um, and led me to water and baptism. Uh, my wife um, has been in the Church of Christ since she was a little girl. Um, and my parents have a Jehovah's Witness background. Um, and so um, meeting my wife and my wife who is Mexican American who would actually go and talk to her, her grandfather um, who graduated from um, the Baxter Institute. And he would give me information that I would and teach her in Spanish and she would come back and teach me in English and I would learn just some things that led me to study scripture for what it is. Um, and then from that aspect was able to see that some things that I had been taught as a kid didn't align with, with what the scripture scriptures were saying. Um, so then I made the choice to, to be baptized. And uh, before we left the parking lot of the church, I told my wife, if we're going to do this, we're going to do it. Like there is no, Going back, we are full steam ahead. And ever since then, working with AJ in the youth group at that point, um, and then coming to Bamel, um, where AJ was and and Trevor at the time. Um, so it's been it's been a good ride. It's been a really good ride. Oh, that's great. AJ, do you want to introduce yourself? All right. So um, my name is Alvin Poole Jr. or AJ. Um, I am a freshman at McPherson College, and I'm only. 18, almost 19, and like two weeks, like from today, two weeks exactly. Um, I'm a communications major, so it's, it's been a crazy thing for me these past couple weeks with everything going on. It's been a nice learning experience. So, um, I, I'm also a student athlete. I'm on scholarship. I've been first in college. Um, I've been playing since I was seven, eight years old. So I just love the game. Uh, I've what, grown up in a Christian household my whole life. I've only known church Sundays, Wednesdays. So just, that's just my life. That's what I do. That's great. So you just had your freshman season at McPherson this past fall? Uh, yes, sir. Oh, great. Great. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Trevor, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? 
So, I'm Trevor Mann. I just graduated from Klein High School. I'm going to Texas Tech University and I'll be studying finance. Um, I've been at Bama my entire life. My grandma and my dad, they moved to Houston or to this side of town when my dad was about like one. So he's been at Bama pretty much his entire life as well. Pretty much when the church started. So like AJ, I've only known Christ, been at church my entire life. So, And how old did you say you are? I'm 18. You're 18 and you just graduated high school? Klein high school. Yes, sir. Okay. How did, how, how did y'all do that, given all that's going on with the coronavirus? Did you have a ceremony, <laughs> so, or, or how did that go? Well, so my graduation date was May 30th. Um, I get to walk at NRG August 1st. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, we had like a, so, so we get to have, like, we had a little Zoom or graduation party, per se, um, last Saturday, so. Oh, cool. So Trevor and AJ, how long have you known each other? And, and, and I, I'm assuming you guys are friends. Yes. So I guess we became close when uh, Sean put AJ and I in the same room at Uplift my eighth grade year. That's right. And then yeah. ever since then, we've just been really close. Uplift is that Harding or where, where is Uplift? That is. That, that's the Harding location. Okay. Great. So you guys have been. I guess that's five years or more now that you've been close. Yeah, that's that's about four or five years. Okay. Somewhere in there. Cool. Mm -hmm. Well, Trevor, I understand that that your great grandfather is someone with that played a role in history. Can you can you tell us a little bit about who he was and and what happened there? Right. So. Sorry. Um, so my great grandfather was mayor of Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, and from the stories that my dad and my grandma have told me, they helped with the schools with Little Rock Nine and that whole situation. And then whenever my great grandfather um, started noticing some changes within that, the KKK started burning crosses in their front yard. There were several um, white supremacy groups, you know, shooting up their house. And so basically my grandfather and his brother and that whole family, they had to come and move to get out of that situation. Move so to Houston? Story, uh, so they moved to Colorado first. Okay. And okay. then And then they came down to... Houston. Okay. Um, what else? But your your grandfather was Wood Woodrow Mill Man. Was Woodrow Wilson Man. Woodrow Wilson Man. Okay. Named after the president, then. Okay. <laughs> and he's your great grand. He was your great grandfather, and I guess he's your dad. Was your dad's grandfather? Yes. Okay. Okay. And so. he. He was the mayor in Little Rock at the time of the Little Rock Nine and, and was the one who, who contacted President Eisenhower and, and basically said, we need, we need your help to stop what's, what's occurring here or what's about to occur here. Yes, sir. Okay. Is that, have you heard, is, are those stories that your family tells, you know, remember about him or, or, or how did you find out that, that your great grandfather played a role in history? So we have this picture in my house of him and it's, it's the main picture on Google, but on the back is like uh, his campaign card. And I did not know that one day, you know, just looking through stuff. I was probably like seven or whatever. And I asked my dad, yo, what is this campaign card? And then he tells me all this. But um, I got to actually meet him before he passed away. Um, I was like a little baby. There's a picture, all four generations. So. Oh, wow. So you so, he died yeah. in 2002, so you would have been. I was a baby. You were a baby. I, I was born the very end of 2001. Okay. Okay. 
So tell me, I guess, Trevor and AJ, there was an incident at a football game. I don't know. Maybe AJ, you, you experienced it. So maybe you could tell us what happened, happened there and kind of what you remember about that. Okay. So from that whole incident, what happened, I, it was, it was first round of the playoffs for uh, high school playoffs, uh -huh. which, you know, it's a big deal because it's Texas. Like, you know, you made it to the playoffs and it was an intense game. We were playing, we were playing Trevor's school, right? And I remember it was the, it was late, real late in the game. I think it was like, what, maybe eight minutes, somewhere around there, left in the game, fourth quarter. And we were we were actually losing. You know, we weren't blowing them out the water or anything. But we were actually losing. And our defense makes a play, so we get the ball, and we're basically in scoring position already. And I remember my mindset was, well, let's just score. You know, the guy in front of me, he's not going to stop us from scoring, so let's just score. And I remember I, 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 I drove him in the dirt one play. And he got real mad. He punched him in the face. And I'm not gonna lie, I punched him back. But the next play was when we uh was when we scored. And I I drive him to the back of the end zone. It was like it was me driving him to the back of the end zone and the running back just running at like the same pace. So we both make it to the end zone at the same time. And then he tries to fight me again. And I, I put my hands up and I'm walking away. He's all in my ear you know, saying all this, these things, and then he, you know, uh -huh. says that word. And I was, I was shocked that he said it, but then it was kind of like, well, that's not the first time I've heard that. And when you say that word, you mean the N word? Yes, sir. So, yeah, it, yeah, it, I, I definitely felt some type of way if yeah, I wanted to do something, I really did anything, but me knowing the rules, you know, of the game, I didn't want to hurt my team based off my own emotions for a word that I've heard before. And I, it sounds kind of messed up, but I mean, that's just, that was just my mentality when it happened. So... And did you say you had a video or something that you could show us of, of what happened? Uh, I actually do. I actually do. I have the whole clip. Let me okay. bring it up. Okay. Let me see. So I'm I am the left guard. It's gonna it's gonna highlight me. Okay. Are you sure? Okay. It's gonna be yeah, right there. And it happens right there. And, you know, call me that word in the middle of all that. So, um, yeah, I, wow. I still kind of can't believe it to this day. But then again, wasn't the first time that's happened. It's not going to be the last. So, uh -huh. and and mm -hmm. how did that make you feel at the time? And and this. You said you had heard it before, but it, I would think that that's something that would leave a mark or make or or you know that that's not something somebody calls you and you just walk away from it and forget about it. Yeah, I I, uh, I was I was definitely angry that he called me that, you know, because it it it's not that it's not like you know I was doing good the entire game only did good for those two plays going forward. So in two plays, he called me that word. Like he stooped to the lowest of the low. So yeah, I was, I was angry. I was definitely angry. I wanted to do something, but you know, I just, I just didn't, I couldn't really do anything. And this, this is, this is a minor detail, but I'm just curious, did your team win the game or who ended up winning? Yeah, actually, yeah that was, that was actually the, the game winning score. Like we, okay. we won out, off of that play. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, Trevor, how did you find out about what happened? So what I can remember is Sean approached me 
asking me if I knew, you know, that guy's number, and I actually did. Um, he, we played football together in middle school. Um, I was really shocked because the tough part that I don't even think Sean or AJ knows is he's also a Christian too. And that's, and that's pretty hard to understand that how can somebody that loves Christ do that? Um, I, like I said, I know the kid or guy now, but I don't know. When Sean told me his number, I I was really devastated to hear that. Sean told me what happened. AJ showed me the clip. So that's how I figured it out. Okay. And how, how did you, you were upset? Did, did you take some kind of action after learning about what had happened? Yeah. So I, th I think it was a Sunday night at life group. Um, and I actually had a class with the guy. Um, the next day, Monday, I think it was like third period. I went up to him and I said, Hey, you played in that Westfield game, right? And he said, yep. Yeah. And I said, you know, you said the N word to one of my really close friends, one of my brothers. And he, he felt bad. He, he was devastated and he knew he was in the wrong. Um, he tried to play it off that he was just frustrated that, you know, he said he was getting beat the whole game, but like AJ said, he, only those two plays. But, I mean, when it's the fourth quarter and, you know, the game's real close, I think Klein was ahead by like two points or three points, and then Westfield scores. And him knowing that, that you know, that's pretty much the game, he said that and just told him you can't do that. No matter what situation, you can't steep to the lows of the lows. Like, just can't. I didn't fight him. I didn't threaten him. Um, just, you know, I just can't. You just can't do that. You can't steep to their level. And so why, why did you feel compelled to confront him? Because it would have – probably been easier for you to just ignore it and not not get involved in it yet you felt like you had to say something to him well like you said um it would just been easier if I just ignored it but honestly it would for me it was easier to confront him um I felt like I had to do something just in my heart my conscience I felt Jesus was talking to me saying, you have to do something about this. Um, you can't, you know, just ignore this. Like AJ said, he's been called it before. Won't be the last time. Like, you just can I hope that I can stop that. Okay. AJ, how did you feel when you heard about about what Trevor had done as far as confronting the guy? Uh, honestly, when I heard that, I was I was shocked because I've never had someone do that for me or do that in general. You know, most people just say, "Oh, oh well, just keep going." So I, I was actually shocked, but you know, grateful because I felt like. And still feel like, you know, okay, this this guy's a good guy. Um, it's just, it just made me feel good, to be honest. It made me feel like I was some something of importance or just I mattered to someone other than my family, you know. So that it just felt, you know, real good. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Sean, you preached about this, or not a, entirely about this situation, but you you mentioned it in a recent sermon that you preached amidst all that's going on in our country right now. Can you can you talk about what you said in your sermon and, and why you felt this was a situation that you thought was worthy of mention at this time? Yeah, and it was, um, you know, I've done some difficult things in my life. That's probably one of the the hardest things that, that I've ever had to do. Um, you know, I, I had a sermon prepared for about two and a half weeks 
before um, I had to record that. And it was, you know, it was Pentecost Sunday. It was a Genesis chapter 11, Tower of Babel to Acts 2 type of depiction. And I got home Tuesday and I recorded it and I hadn't looked on, you know, I hadn't looked at the news. I hadn't looked at social media the whole day because I was busy at church. And I took a shower and I laid down and I just started looking at um, just the news and what was taking place with George Floyd um, and all the stuff that was just happening in our country at the time. And I laid down and go to sleep and I, I couldn't sleep. I just could not sleep. And something in my conscience said that there's no way I could, you know, preach a sermon on Sunday and not speak about the issues that we're currently facing. And so I got up and I just started writing. And at about two o'clock in the morning, I, I was done. And I talked to our shepherds the next day and just told them um, how I felt and how, you know, at, our, at Bama, we are a diverse congregation. Um, and we are a congregation that is really striving to live in diversity and inclusion um, and be a voice for that within the kingdom. And um, our shepherds are fully support that. And so I re-recorded that, that video the next day on Wednesday night and it was extremely difficult. Um, but I talked to um, Trevor's father um, and I asked him permission if I could speak about his grandfather, Woodrow Wilson Mann. Um, and after he spoke to um, his mother and I, I got the approval to share that story because it is a very private story. I mean, you can Google his name and, and you won't even get all the information of what, what the Mann family endured during that time. So I really wanted to be respectful of that story, but also of the story between Trevor and AJ. Um, and so, and just speaking in those terms and, and taking it from the divide that we have in our country systemically, even going back to the Vietnam War in the 60s, coupled with the civil rights movement in the 60s, and use that as, a, as, a, as, a, as an illustration of how in many ways we're divided as a country now. We have this um, silent, invisible enemy in the coronavirus, but we have this visible enemy of racism um, that we need to address both of them. But so oftentimes we forget about the visible um, because we're numb to it. And so um, using that as an illustration and talking about um, the legacy of Woodrow Wilson Mann and how that cascaded down to generations to Trevor um, for speaking up um, for not just his brother in Christ, but his friend. Um, you know, Trevor and I, we went to go see AJ play in round three um, up in Sam Houston uh, when they played football and they, and they won that game. And so just being in a position to bring attention to something using the relationships that we've cultivated um, and the deposits that we've made in each other's life um, and to see, you know, AJ have to endure something that, um, as a black man myself, he said it perfectly. Um, it, it will be told that again. And the numb reality that whenever something like that happens, I think the AJ putting his hands up um, gets me emotional every time because that's, that's what we have to do. Um, we have to put our hands up and walk away because um, the way the story can be spun is that we, we, we are now the violent one. And so um, AJ has had the conversation with his parents multiple times of how to engage in instances of injustice. And I think it's the beauty of this story is that Trevor has also had conversations with his parents on what he should do at times of injustice. Um, so I think that's the perfect illustration of showing how two people come from totally two different narratives, but yet their parents have had the intentional heart to teach how to love one another and speak up for one another, regardless of the situation. Um, wrong is wrong. Um, and I think that's what we need more in this country. We need more in this world of people sharing the narrative of one another um, to be ambassadors for Christ, but also advocates for, for their fellow neighbor. AJ and Trevor, what do you do? The two of you have any thoughts on what what's happening in our country now, as far as some of the racial issues that we're seeing play out in in cities across the country, and even there in Houston, where George Floyd used to live? 
You want to go first or me? Um, so, yeah, I, I definitely do. I usually, you know, I usually don't really say anything when stuff like this happens, but I, I kind of felt compelled to, you know, use my voice and just let people know. It's like, do I condone, do I like seeing all the violence and stuff going on? No. And all the buildings on fire? No, I don't. But I can understand why, you know. Um, this gener like this generation of new young adults of like myself or 18 through 22, you know, we have to, we've had to grow up with seeing, uh, you know, Trayvon Martins and the Tamir Rice's and the Alton Sterling's and now with countless others and we've had three in the past two months, three or four in the past two months, it's kind of like, why is it still happening now? You know, this, I have, I have family members that are, you know, late in their ages, you know, 70s, maybe 80s. And, you know, they're still seeing this stuff and they're like, okay, well, why is it still happening now? Um, we tried, people have tried peaceful protests a lot. It's all throughout history. Tried it and tried it and tried it. And people have been beaten for it and seen as un-American for it. And even even up to recent with uh, Capitol they taking a knee, how they spun that out the narrative, and they told him to just leave the country, and he lost his job for it. And now, when people start getting violent, or a select few start getting violent, now all of a sudden it's well, why don't they peacefully protest? And my opinion on it is well, we've been peacefully protesting and saying, hey, this isn't fair. And they're just, they'll just shrug it off. It's like, oh, okay. And we'll say it again and again and again. And it still happens. You know, and those are the ones that are just recorded. You can't even probably count how many haven't been recorded. And so, yeah, it, it, uh, it's, it's tough, you know, seeing all that's going on. Don't get me wrong, but it's, for some reason, for some reason, whenever you, whenever people started doing that, now people are starting to listen, which doesn't make sense because we've been saying this throughout history. My grandparents grew up with that, you know, seeing all the violence that they've endured. And that was when it was really bad, you know, and now I'm still growing up with this. 18, 18, almost 19 years old, and it's like, why do why do I still have to go through this? You know, why are they just now listening when they should have listened years and years and years ago? You know that that's just my opinion on it. I don't condone the the looting, the rioting, and the burning of the cities and everything, but I definitely understand why, and it's definitely getting more awareness out there, especially because there's a lot of people at home. You have news, you have media, because what else are you going to do? I mean, we're all at home. So now, you know, we're all aware to this. And it's not like this is something brand new. It's just that now it's like everyone can see this because it's being filmed. And now people are in shock, but I don't know why they're in shock because this has been going on for years and years and years and years, you know. I mean, we sit through a history class and we learn about this stuff happening to our grandparents. That's not that long ago. I have aunts and uncles that are in their 70s, 80s, and that seems like it's 100 years ago. That's, that's not. That's, that's just 19, this is 20. Like, it's not that long ago. So I'm... Again, you know, it's tough to see all this happening, but I'm just glad to see that people are starting to realize now, like, okay, well, maybe there's, there is something that has to be changed.
Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Trevor, did you have any thoughts? Um, to be honest, I don't know what to say. Um, this has been going on, like AJ said, for hundreds of years. Um, I can't really say anything except for I understand why people are doing it. Things have to change. But I don't know what to say. Um, the Bama Instagram put a story out, and it said, we stand with Jesus, we stand against racism, and we stand in love. And that's all I have to say. Oh, that's great. And, Sean, I guess maybe we'll wrap this up back where, with the story of, of these two young men that, that touched you so much, and that it, I'm sure will touch other people immensely when they felt like what happened or when they, when they, under, when they hear what happened, if I could talk. But I guess maybe this is an example of what happened with, with, with Trevor and AJ of, of we, sometimes I think we feel like that there's, it's such a big thing that what can anyone do? But maybe in this case, we saw what one person can do to make a difference. Yeah, I, I think this, this embodies what minorities, particularly in this country, have been wanting since the shores of America deposited slaves into this environment. We've wanted a voice that is, has the ability to be heard. And unfortunately, history has taught us that often voices um, like AJ, like mine, um, like those before, necessarily aren't heard unless it is spoken with a sense of eloquence and slight passion um, where it cannot be viewed as anger. But when voices like Trevor, um, when voices like yours, Bobby, um, can bring attention to not just the issues in the world, but practical examples of what you can do, um, being a voice, standing up, um, embodying Jesus, walking alongside someone and not allowing oppression of any kind um, to impact his fellow human. Um, that's the example that, that we, wanna, we wanna set. And I'm incredibly proud of AJ and Trevor for both how they independently, but collectively handled this situation. Um, it, is a, it is a true embodiment of, of how Christ lived.